Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member uh, of the Palestine Israel Network at the United Church of Christ, uh, along with Lauren and others, and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. We're delighted today, and I know we have other people coming, uh, we're delighted today to speak with our friend, minister, artist, poet, activist, Reverend Lauren McRail. Uh, Lauren spent five years serving the YWCA of Palestine for the Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ. And maybe some, somewhere along the way, Lauren, you can explain your relationship with the Church of Scotland. Mm. And she's on the steering committee of the United Church of Christ uh, Palestine Israel Network and a member of Rochester Witness for Palestine in Rochester, New York. Um, finally, Lauren will be here in Fort Wayne, Indiana in November to share more of her stories, poems, artwork, and uh, her experiences uh, during her five years in uh, Beit Sahor and throughout uh, the West Bank. So Lauren, uh, thanks for joining us today very much. It's great to see you. Great to have you here. Lauren, uh, we, I know you have a presentation that we want to get to, and that's very important, but I want to begin just by asking for some of your general impressions with what's happening in Jerusalem, Gaza, Palestine, Israel today. We're all, you know, moved uh, deeply by what we're seeing uh, on news reports. I know you've remained in contact with your friends in the region. You and I exchanged a couple of notes where you spoke about being devastated by what's happening in Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah, uh, Gaza and more. So just share, share with us uh, some of your feelings and what you're hearing from your friends. Um, thank you. I, I'm going to, um, before I get to that, just say a couple little more clarifying things about why I was over there. I, I went over with the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program of Israel and Palestine in 2013 in the Arab Spring, and I served in Bethlehem. And it was in that uh, time period, I'd never gone on any Holy Land trip. Um, I'm looking at Jeff Wright, and he graciously took me to do what normal people do, and you see the sights, and you know, I just flew right into Bethlehem and was at the checkpoint every morning at four o'clock. So I got thrown into and learned uh, quite quickly um, what we were supposed to do around international law and human rights. And we were writing reports for the UN that became very important when two years later, I was selected to be a mission coworker for Israel, Palestine, serving the YWCA of Palestine. And, and so I have to, I always used to have to remember to say all of that. And I was connected, and I guess I still am connected to the Church of Scotland because um, I needed a visa to stay. And the old days, you could go in and out every few weeks. Um, or well, every three months, but that clearly wasn't happening. And many of our uh, short-term volunteers were being turned away. And so, uh, and I had already gotten a restricted movement ban that I wasn't supposed to go to the West Bank. And um, so it was because of that, that I went to the Church of Scotland and threw myself on the altar. No, I didn't do that, but I said, I'll do whatever you need so that I can get this precious clergy visa. Without that, I would not have been able to stay for the five years that I was there. And also because of the Church of Scotland, uh, they have partners like our church um, in Gaza. So I got to go into Gaza twice a year, um, mostly. Um, and, and so uh, got to know the people and our partners there. And that became another aspect of my work. Um, and, and, and through the Church of Scotland, I was representing them sometimes, um, often in um, situations where I was representing the Church of Scotland, reading scripture and lots of 
bizarre and interesting stories about being a woman minister over there. Um, so how am I feeling? Uh, when I said devastation, I, I forgot that I'd been feeling this way for a while. Um, and it was very specifically, Michael, I had just seen the picture of Mahmoud el Kurd being arrested, beaten up and arrested uh, in Sheikh Jarrah. And I, um, I know the Al-Qurd family and uh, I know Muhammad uh, very well and I got to know his whole family. So like any parent, um, try not to cry, I told myself not to cry. Um, there's my boy who's now a grown man and he's probably been defending his family as anyone would and now he's being hauled off. And we who work on issues related to Palestinian children know that they can be held in administrative detention for up to a year with no charge. And no one is allowed to see them and all kinds of torture goes on. So that was my first devastation um, with the recognition of that. Uh, I had been speaking to Mohammed before he was trying to get back to be with his family. He was being blocked. He had to go through Jordan. And now I just worry about him. And I'm also really proud of him. He is on MSNBC giving news reports, Democracy Now! And um, part of my pride is um, that when he was in 10th grade, 11th grade, um, we talked and I said, you need to go to college somewhere. Um, and if you want to go to the United States, I will help you. And then we embarked on a, a, a rigorous study of learning you know, the TOEFL prep and, and SATs and you know, me filling him with all kinds of tough vocabulary words. His English is amazing, as you can tell from listening to him. Uh, when I met him, he had amazing oral language based on listening to Lady Gaga and Marilyn Mason and translating for foreign um, journalists, all crazy mixed up English. Um, and I, and, but reading was not his strength in English. And then so we did, you know, I was an English teacher. So to see him now so clear, so focused, um, so precise with his language, um, uh, it, it's, it's so important. Um, so the devastation now is like you, uh, I am both, uh, traumatized looking at my Facebook page with yet more and more reports. Cause I know people all over the world and inside who are reporting things that are not known by the news that we get. And so I'm also very angry with the news that we are being fed and the language that is being used. So, um, and, and though I was not diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, uh, certainly this last week or so has brought everything from the past. I was there during the Gaza siege offensive. That's what we called it. And I reported every week from the YWCA on women and children, mostly who was killed and what the numbers were. And I always started my alert, these were alerts, with Israel does not have the right to self-defense. That was always my first sentence. And one day Mira said, why do you always say that? I said, because CNN starts their news with Israel has the right to self-defense. And they don't. They are the occupier. Under international law, they do not have this right. And every time you hear that, you can't hear anything else or yeah. you hear everything else through that particular way. And the second part, which is um, a struggle for me as a Christian minister who is um, a, a strong believer in nonviolence, but under international law, the occupied, in this case, Hamas, has the right to self-defense, has the right to those rockets. Nobody has the right to go around targeting civilians. So I wrestle with that. Uh, 
I wrestle and I just simply hold the two truths that those are both true. And, um, and so all the news reports that we get, as you know, they start right away with the Gaza rockets. And I just want to tear my hair out. Yeah. So um, I want to take you through my tiny um, PowerPoint. So I want to just talk about this weird little picture before I move on. Uh, it became actually a picture for the Presbyterian Church um, as uh, evidence that Caterpillar was still involved in destroying, um, in this case, olive groves. This is in Beit Sahur. And this is when they were continuing to build the wall. And for I was- folks, Lauren, for some of our folks, Beit Sorry. Sahur is right outside Bethlehem. It's, a, it's an adjoining community, one of the three parts of the Christian triangle there uh, uh, in Bethlehem, Beit Sor, and Beit Jala. Yes. And that's where the y, YWCA, uh, that's where you worked. Well, I didn't, I worked in uh, the Jerusalem office of oh, the okay. YWCA, but okay. I did this as my witness there is how I would put it. And, okay. and so um, what, what is going on in my head is um, <laughs> that I am thinking for a brief moment, should I, throw myself around that olive tree over there uh, and do a kind of Rachel Corey thing. And then what would Peter Macari, my boss think if I did that, <laughs> would I be killed? Would I just be deported? And, and so, you know, I'm just struggling. Um, and, and so it's one of my favorite pictures and I'm also trying to look tough. Um, and I'm the only woman with a bunch of um, both Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox and Catholic priests who are not quite sure what to do with me, that I've shown up to be with them. Um, I wasn't able to repair the slide well enough, but um, this is John Dauhauer from the United Church of Christ. And I am giving him, which you can't see because I messed it up here, um, my first assemblage piece, which was called Broken Jerusalem. So I've been looking at it a lot lately. It's full of pottery shards from um, plates that I had broken and, and glass, uh, the glass um, that I had broken also from Hebron. And I, in fact, in it, I, I have blood on it because I, I hurt my finger and, and I was uh, kind of left it there. And now, uh, particularly this last week with so much bloodshed, um, I'm sort of like, wow, uh, there it is once again. This is Muhammad's um, grandmother who died at age 103. Uh, and she is like the grandmother of everyone in Sheikh Jarrah and throughout the world really um, because uh, of her story. And so originally this talk uh, was gonna focus on Sheikh Jarrah going back to 1948 and her story um, embodies the, the larger narrative, the, her family, the al Khord family uh, had been in Haifa in 1948 and they had been forcibly um, expelled uh, from their home. They wandered uh, to Jordan, a few other places. And later, I think in 1950, a few years later, UNRWA, when UNRWA was founded and funded they offered eight families a home in what's in Sheikh Jarrah. And this and Jarrah, of, UNRWA is the United Nations Relief and Works Agency and Sheikh Jarrah is a neighborhood. Tell us a little bit more about what, where Sheikh Jarrah yes. is. And, um, it's in East Jerusalem, occupied East Jerusalem that was illegally annexed. And, and so it is occupied territory. Historically, it is a very important area for Palestinian history. Some of the uh, sort of wealthiest and, and upright um, uh, members of society lived in Sheikh Jarrah. It's also where the Hind Husseini school uh, was founded right behind the American Colony Five Star Hotel. Uh, the Hind Husseini school uh, took in orphans 
from the massacre of Der Yassin. Der Yassin is a village outside of Jerusalem. And during 1948, uh, as a way to scare the Palestinians to leave their homes, uh, there was a massacre. And mm -hmm. these are the children as the result of that massacre. Mm -hmm. So this is not just a neighborhood. It's a neighborhood of um, highly significant for Palestinian Jerusalem, Jerusalemites. And also, in addition, for these families that were given homes there, uh, which meant they gave up their refugee status. And if they paid a nominal fee in three or four years time, these homes were theirs. And so she and her family lived there uh, since that time period. So for them, this was their home. If she had lived, this would have been her second, um, if, I won't use the word eviction, her second forced transfer, which even that doesn't really capture it, uh, being expelled from their homes. And, and there's some interesting little memes going around with the idea that she was 103. So she is older than the state of Israel. And how is it that she could be forced from her home? She's holding Jasmine, which was her signature um, thing. She would hold it. And if she liked you, if somehow you made it through uh, her very tough questioning, which she always questioned me um, to see if I was worthy and, trust and trustful, um, she would give me a piece of the jasmine. This is from a, a statement from Mohammed. It may be a little too much to read, but he and others, and perhaps you, the Nakba was not an event that happened only in the founding of the state of Israel. And when you're there, you go from this weird schizophrenic moment of on May 15th, you commemorate the great catastrophe. That's what Nakba means. And then the next day, Israel is celebrating their independence. Uh, and, and, and both of those realities exist in the two different ways that history is told. And so in this uh, writing right here, Muhammad is using all of his wonderful English skills in telling us what is actually going on in the court case. And one of the things that they were given uh, because of public pressure from us and others around the world, and maybe even the International Criminal Court, because there were petitions to take this to the court, um, that this would be a war crime. This is ethnic cleansing. And then he said, and I'm just going to read the tiny part in there. We, the four Sheikh Shara families, firmly reject the terms of this agreement, for these are our homes and the settlers are not our landlords. The inherently unjust system of Israel's colonial courts is not considering questioning the illegal settlers' ownership and has already decided on the family's disposition. They were given like a few days to see if they, the settlers, the illegal settlers, who are mostly American, uh, but not entirely Jews, who have been allowed to come to Israel because Israel accepts the right of return uh, from Jews from all over the world to claim Israel as their, um, to become citizens of the state of Israel. So you can see how, um, how careful uh, he is using the language here that the system already is stacked against you. Yeah. I love this picture. I've been watching so many horrible pictures. This is the, the, the families in Sheikh Shirah every night during Ramadan uh, when the sun goes down and they are allowed to eat. They have been, as we would say in the Christian world, breaking bread. And that is Muna al Kurd, wonderful, beautiful face on the left. She is the twin of Muhammad. And they were born on May 15th. Oh, wow. And so uh, when I met him, at some point, since I had sort of adopted him as my, my son, I said, well, when is your birthday so we can celebrate? And he goes, I've never celebrated my birthday. 
don't you know, we do not celebrate al Nakba. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, we made a deal that the following year, we would celebrate it on a different day. And I, who never raised uh, a, a, a son, a boy, uh, threw a birthday party for 16 year old Muslim boys in my little um, garden. And he had never had a birthday. He was overwhelmed. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about one of the women that I came uh, to know and, and to learn her story. So the YWCA, um, we decided early on that what a good use of my English skills um, and advocacy would be to focus on the rights of refugees and the refugee camps that the Y was involved with. And that one, because we focused on women and children, we learned, well, I learned from them that the women in the camps, and some of them have been there, now we're talking four or five generations, were, were about to either die and or forget um, the stories of what happened to them in 48. So for my former life, I, I prepared myself to do interviews and this is Miriam, and I'll show you afterwards the doll that we have uh, made in her name. It was my first interview and very powerful. And when I do presentations, I sort of uh, reenact the moment. But what I will say is the church uh, commissioned me as, as to go out into the mission field to do my work, but it was Miriam who let me into her life poured her story into me, and as I tell it, anointed me for the mission that I was on for those five years, which was simple and sometimes really difficult, which was to listen, to listen to the hard stories of suffering. And when you could, when the tea came or the dapka came, you danced and you celebrated. And, and so in that way, I was, um, as we say in ethnography, an inside outsider. And, and she was the person who initiated that. This slide got very uh, smushed by expending it like this. I, I wanna talk about the, the language um, that is being used now. And so when you hear people say, particularly Palestinians, the Nakba never ended or this is an ongoing Nakba in Sheikh Jarrah. What they're saying is that the violence, the uprooting, the expulsion from your lands, um, the wall, all of it has been going on nonstop since 1948. And it's important, I think, for each of us committed to um, standing in solidarity with Palestinians that we be able to answer others, including the news, with a, uh, with a context. So, you know, as you can see here, all these terrible things, I shot a rocket back. So when you hear people say, but Hamas has rockets and it's shooting at um, Israelis, uh, and I always put in context about the occupied and the occupier, but I also put in context that this has been going on for a long time. So, you, so the question isn't who shot the rocket first. What I do understand from the Palestinian perspective there, that Israel had been bombing as they often do, uh, nobody talking about it, bombing Gaza before the rockets from Gaza went out. But Hamas did say, if you um, continue to basically abuse uh, with your aggression, the Palestinians in Jerusalem, there will be accountability. And everybody knows what that means. And particularly if you do this during Ramadan and you attack the worshipers and or Al-Aqsa Mosque, which Israel did. And so faithful to their own word, they did shoot rockets. And my, um, I think Michael was gonna ask me about this. 
I feel very strongly that as Christians, both inside Palestine and out, that at the minimum level, we must stand up very strongly. Um, even if you don't completely understand what's going on in Sheikh Jarrah or even Gaza, it is by no measure okay for anyone to bomb worshipers in their worship place. You add to that, that it's Ramadan. You add to that, that that is the third holiest site in Islam. It's an act of terror and it has to be called out like that. And Jordan, I understand, um, was called or, or they took it very seriously because they're in charge of the holy sites that uh, yeah. one of their envoys came to Ramallah with some paperwork um, to assure the Palestinians that they would uh, respond. This is one of my art pieces. It's, um, it's very eerie for me to look at the art that I made there in light of current events. I was documenting the violence that I was experiencing, mostly uh, in fights. Um, on, uh, they're not skirmishes, they're not clashes, it's not a conflict, but these um, events, for lack of better words, that were happening every Friday. And I picked up the sponge bullets that you see on the outside. These are the bullets that are blinding people now as we speak. In the middle is either a sound bomb and or a, um, it's a, another form of tear gas. And, and because it's round, it can roll. Um, so it's very effective that way. The other little um, silver pieces are smaller tear gas canisters made in the United States, somewhere in Pennsylvania. And the, um, the bullets off this are from Nabi Sala. Nabi Sala is a village outside of Ramallah where one of the longest resistance movements has been going on uh, to hold on to their spring and to hold on to their land. And you probably know Ahed Tamimi and Jana uh, Tamimi. They are um, uh, young women who have been very bold. Ahed was imprisoned for a while. Jana, knowing that I was making art as she does out of these bullets and things, gave me um, these that these are live bullets that had been um, shot at the children in Nabi Sala. The uh, uh, Tamimi family and the Bernat family both have little canisters where they've planted little flowers yes. and hung them on their fences. Uh, that's also another way that they've been rebaptized, you know, and made, um, yeah, made into something that more useful. Yes. And I, um, I want to, um, and I, I've been influenced by that. So my working with bullets and things, I guess you could say has a history. Uh, I want to go back from, actually, I'll do this afterwards so you can see my face. So I came across this recently ending apartheid is in our hands. And I believe that um, this is particularly true for Americans. And you may or may not know that right after the Human Rights Watch report came out mm, a few weeks ago now, it's pretty big news. They are not, they were not known to be um, uh, really engaged in what was happening in Israel and Palestine. So for them to come out with a 240 page report about violations was a big deal. And right after that, uh, a number of congressional representatives, Republicans and Democrats uh, signed a letter in which they say that military aid to Israel should never, never be conditioned we just give it. So later today, when I meet with um, others here in the Rochester area and the Rochester Witness for Palestine, um, I will be calling out our representative, um, Joe Morelli, who's one of the signatories on that letter. And, and so it is important for us uh, to do what we can. Um, and I think, quite frankly, if the U.S., if we could possibly stop this military aid, this whole thing would, if not be over, it would be completely a different story. Yeah. Um, 
our money supports everything you see. And this is um, a piece that is, um, as you can see, it has a little bit of a poem and I'm gonna end this and then come back so you, we can talk uh, a little bit more. And this comes from a Mahmoud Darwish poem and I title it, all my pieces have writing with it because I'm essentially a poet writer type who also does other things. So I call this close to the gardens, the gardens of broken shadows. Hope on the slopes of hills, facing the dusk and the canon of time, close to the gardens of broken shadows. We do what prisoners do and what the jobless do. We cultivate hope. In God's garden of broken shadows, facing night and canons of time, we are commanded to cultivate hope. How? How do we dare speak of hope when all around us are signs of dispossession, destruction, and continued catastrophe? God's creation is groaning under the weight of settler colonialism and a belligerent military occupation in the land between the sea and the river that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all call holy. How do we speak of hope when each day records new human rights violations, another family made homeless, a school demolished, a nonviolent activist imprisoned, a village disappeared? On earth as it is in heaven, not yet. Is hope still possible? Was it ever? St. Augustine wrote, hope has two daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, encouraged to make sure they do not stay that way. He saw hope as a mother who gives life and mourns what that life is threatened or violent or violated. Her daughters are righteous rage and the courage to stand where God stands or where Jesus leads. To cultivate hope then we must adopt hope's daughters as our own. So this is how we cultivate hope. We go to the places of suffering and struggle, to the garden of broken shadows. We stand where God stands, and we join God's mission for another world. We become gardeners in that garden of abundant life and broken shadows. So I do believe that, and I am... Um, as a Christian, I, I use um, freely um, the sacred stories and the tradition I come from, knowing that other people have other ways of framing this. Lauren, thank you for that presentation. Let me, uh, uh, Elizabeth Myers wrote in the chat room that uh, Trevor Noah courageously spoke out last night over eight minutes about the uh, uh, what's happening there and uh, about the injustice to the Palestinians. And it's gone viral and uh, seen by over 2 million people. We also have a friend of yours, John Thomas. Uh, uh, let's, read, let's read what he's asking here before we get to my questions. Hi, Lauren, are you going to the demonstration at the federal building at 4 p.m.? I guess uh, uh, yes. we know the answer to that. Good, yes. Let me ask you, um, you, uh, you referenced the Christian churches. Uh, a recent article uh, uh, quoted former Israeli ambassador to Washington, D.C., Ron Dermer. This is what he said. Israel should spend more of its energy reaching out to passionate American evangelicals than Jews who are disproportionately among our critics. Well, I know. I, I so, in other words, uh, uh, he's he's saying that there are more evangelicals who are supporting Israel than American Jews uh, today. But uh, let me ask you. I, I know it, it's it's uh, low hanging fruit to be critical of Christian Zionists, which we should be. Obviously, their their theology is heretical, as the Kairos Palestine document said. But as a pastor who's active in her own denomination's response to Israel's injustices, what kind of message do you have for us in the mainline, in the mainline churches? Um, 
I think we should not assume that we have also uh, moved past or disregarded or, or really dealt with Christian Zionism ourselves. Yeah. Many of our hymns are um, very much uh, put at the center, uh, this belief that this holy land belongs to the Jewish people because of Abraham's promise. And I'm, I'm happy to say, or I don't know if happy is the right word, but um, in the United Church of Christ, through the UCC pen group and brave churches throughout, we have a resolution coming to our general synod this year. And it is a resolution that is really shaped um, in the spirit of the Barman Declaration. It is more than just uh, all the things we've tried to do before, like um, talk about uh, the right to boycott, uh, or to divest our funds from those corporations and companies that are profiting from the illegal occupation. We put it all together and said in response to Kairos Palestine, who asked Christians throughout the world that this is the moment you need to speak up and you really need to do something. So we took that very seriously. And one of the, I'm looking um, at one of the things that we say, um, and I, I think we have an affirmation uh, and it speaks very much to what you're saying, Michael. We affirm that the biblical narrative beginning with creation and extending through the calling of Israelites, the corrective admonitions of the prophets, the incarnation and ministry of Jesus, and the witness of the apostles to the ends of the earth speaks of God's blessing extending to all the families of the earth. This is our way of saying there is not a chosen people and that God's blessing extends to all. And then in the therefore section, we reject any theology or ideology, including Christian Zionism, supersession, anti-Semitism, or anti-Islam bias that would privilege or exclude any one nation, race, culture, or religion within God's universal economy of grace. So I'm very proud to see this. Um, it's not the first time the church has said this, but we have to say it, I think. Um, I myself used to get asked these questions and I still get asked these questions here. Um, you know, don't I believe in Abraham's promise? And then depending on how energetic I am or snarky I am, I go, oh, you mean the ones, the descendants, plural? And they go, hmm. And then I go, so Sarah and Hagar's children, the descendants of Abraham. And they go, well, no, 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 not Hagar. She's, she's not in this. Um, and then, you know, again, depending on how much time and energy you want to give to this. And, and I, I quote Muhammad, um, actually, my friend Muhammad al Kord, And uh, when we talked about this, and he was still talking about Sheikh Sharar, you know, years later after the settlers had been occupying his house, he said, is your God a real estate agent? I went, no, he's not. <laughs> he said, then why do people think that God has given this land, you know, uh, for them and only them. And I must say, as a Christian coming in, when I was questioned uh, always when I came in, except when I had my clergy visa, um, there was always this question, why are you coming here? And, and I had to control myself because my sacred story happened here and I have a right to come. I mean, it's not just for some people, but the whole issue of chosenness um, is deeply American too. We in the United States have a whole history, a secular history in which we, that mixes with our understanding of Christianity that we were to be the light on the hill. And we in the United Church of Christ who claim congregational roots, uh, we love to play up, I believe our uh, anti-racism history, our abolition history, 
but we are related to those same people who felt they were sent by God, they were God's chosen. That is deeply embedded in the American identity. It's not just a Christian aspect. Say, say uh, uh, you, you referenced Kairos Palestine and uh, the Kairos Palestine document in 2009. Say a word about their more recent uh, uh, cry for hope, uh, <laughs> a call to Christians, another call uh, to Christians around the world for, quote, decisive action. And the subtitle of that is, we cannot serve God and the oppression of Palestinians. So say a word about Kairos Palestine and their cry for hope, would you please? Um, so you, thank you for giving the, the history because this is not their first cry for hope. And I'm, I'm gonna ask when we unmute, maybe Jeff to give them a little um, deeper um, discussion about them. Uh, they are um, a mix of Christians uh, from different denominations who managed to come together in 2009, as I understand it, in particular, um, the Secular Society of Palestinians had voted to support um, the boycott divestment sanction movement. And uh, the Christians of the land had not responded to this call. And after I imagine deliberations and discussion felt they had to weigh in. So that first um, call to Christians throughout the world in particular included two things that made it very uh, controversial. One was to call the occupation a sin, you know, and, and not just like it is against international law, it's not a good thing, it's a sin. And, and uh, Desmond Tutu has also um, used that language and it did call for the support of boycott divestment sanction. And it's out of that that many of the churches, including our church, the Presbyterian church, now the Methodist church, and even the Lutheran church has a screen um, that we are responding to look where our church monies go to make sure they're not invested in companies and or products that support. But this latest cry for hope, and, and even if you just take that in, it is a cry. Yeah. It's not an ask. And right. when I was leaving there in 2018. There was a sense of we're going to disappear. And you're going to come here and all you are going to see are some old churches. The Palestinian Christian population is like less than 1% in Jerusalem. I'm not sure I have the figures correct in Bethlehem now, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was less than 4%. The, the Palestinians in general are suffering. Uh, the Christians are leaving and they're not leaving because of Muslims, which I used to also hear even from within living there. They're leaving because there is no future. There's nowhere to go. There are no jobs. And so if you have the means to send your children abroad to school, those kids are most likely not coming back because there is nothing to come back to when you live in an apartheid state. And we do claim this word in our resolution. It almost didn't pass the vetting committee because we used it in the beginning of our resolution and they all got twisted up we rework the language to talk about Jim Crow in the United States and make a parallel construction. And then, I don't know if it was divine providence or an accident, they didn't take out the apartheid word in the latter half of our resolution, so it stands. Because after we do these words in which we affirm, therefore, we do declare this along with Beth Selim, one of our partners, which is an Israeli human rights organization, and now with Human Rights Watch and others, that there is no debate. This is an apartheid state. And this isn't just a choice adjective, it has legal consequences. And even if Israel and the United States do not consider 
the International Criminal Court, an authority that they must obey, all the other states in the world mostly do. And if it is an apartheid state, we have to do what happened in South Africa. You have to withdraw your trade agreements. Uh, you have to stop um, playing sports. You, you stop all relationships because you are not allowed to comply with an apartheid state. That's why that word is so loaded. Um, it's also why Richard Fox study was taken literally off the United Nations website because Israel and the United States were so afraid of what would happen if the world actually did understand that this was an apartheid system. Let me uh, get to another question that uh, for in our chat room, Lauren, uh, it's from uh, one of our friends here in Fort Wayne who traveled with, uh, with me uh, pre-COVID. Let me just read it to you. One reason that Israel gets away with what it does is the painful reality that over the last hundred plus years, the Palestinian brand has generously, generally been perceived as negative, especially in the U.S. Unfortunately, due to the backing of wrong parties in various wars and noted acts of terrorism, knowing that the Palestinian people of today should not be held responsible for those acts and alliances of the past, how can the Palestinian brand be reimagined and better perceived? Wow. That's a, that's a very big thing. I, I, I'm, I'm wrapping my head around brand because I don't see it as a brand. Right. Um, it, and so my first response is the Palestinian story that includes the Nakba, which means, you know, just to break it down. And I remember sometimes just really flabbergasted that the world leaders could conceive that the way to deal with anti-Semitism after World War II was to partition an existing country and give it away to 10% of the population, because that's what happened. How in the world could that ever have been thought of as a good idea? So the Palestinian people responded and you have the Arab-Israeli war as 750,000 people were turned into refugees within a two year period of time. Over 500 villages were destroyed. And then we, mostly in the Western world, have the nerve, the gall, the, I don't know what else to call it, to say they're, they're a violent people, they're terrorists. And I will never forget in one of my many, um, you know, I spent a lot of time on the road talking after my um, time in the mission field. And I think I was in Oregon and I, there were farmers who mostly came to my presentation. And I thought, oh, they're never gonna understand what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, I, you know, this, how did I get here? And then I just looked and I said, well, imagine if someone came to your farm and said, it's no longer yours and we're gonna give it to these people over here. What would you do? And they said, that's not gonna happen. We're gonna fight for it. So I think this idea that the Palestinian people are known as terrorists, it skips over the deep um, aggressions, uh, violations, the, the robbing of their humanity. And, and th that's where we come in. And we can't just come in on trying to change our government and its policies. We actually absolutely must do that, but we have to bring the humanity into the story. We have to allow people to see that they are people just like us. And, and if we were in their shoes or we are in the shoes of Native Americans in the United States, whose land was also stolen. We need to bring those perspectives forward. That's why Miriam's story is so important. And, and all the stories, the story of- all those are all histories, yeah. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I can't really answer because I, I'm struggling with the, the brand issue of the question. And I don't know if I, I have very well. 
let's uh let me let me you and i've talked a little bit uh, uh over the last couple of weeks in preparation and before the conversation today and also we've seen some articles uh uh, uh interviews with other palestinian leaders um where from the palestinian perspective this is being viewed as the next whether it's the third or fourth but the next intifada yeah and uh, uh Talk about, from, just from your experiences as an outside insider, but also your friendship with the Al-Kurd family and others. Talk to us a little bit about this sense of uprising, the younger generation, uh, the, the, where, where, how the seeds have been planted for it, et cetera. So I, I was checking in with the different people in the last few days Originally, I was checking in to say, is this going to turn into World War III? So I, I like went way past the Intifada and like, you know, is Hezbollah on the border? Are they ready to bomb? You know, this is where I was going. And they had a totally different narrative going on. And not the narrative that I'm trying to undo the thing about, you know, Gaza being allowed to bomb or not. Their narrative is this is the uprising. This is the intifada. Intifada means shaking off oppression. And it has caught the imagination and the will and the power of the youth. And it's not just in Jerusalem. It's not just in the West Bank. It is inside Israel now also. And they are not aligned with uh, the PA uh, and Abbas. They're not aligned with Hamas. They are not aligned. And this is what I saw when I first went in 2013, the Arab Spring. The youth were struggling to get a foothold and all of those parties basically suffocated them. But this, this is different. And um, I think part of it is for whatever reason, what has happened in Sheikh Jarrah has been a tipping point. Unfortunately, the bombing of Gaza has become normalized. Um, in fact, they have horrible expressions. Um, it's time to mow the grass. That's how they refer to the Gazans. Yeah. But also, you have attacked Al-Aqsa. You have attacked our holy site. Now, I know, and I was always told, if they attack Al-Aqsa or they're digging underground and, and something terrible happens to Al-Aqsa, holy war will break out because every Muslim who is a practicing Muslim must defend Al-Aqsa. So Israel has gone way beyond its norm. And I don't, I mean, so I hear de-escalate, de-escalate. That's what the UN is trying to do. That's what we are saying. No, this has to play out. And if we were really faithful to a just peace, then we don't stick with de-escalate or we escalate our efforts to stop and we stop the military aid and we hold Israel accountable and we stop our trade and we stop. That is what is now required from the cry for hope is for us to actually put our statements, uh, beautiful as they are, into action. Because, so it's, it's the absolute opposite of de-escalate. Not that we should escalate violence, we should escalate our efforts to really deal with the root source. And the root source is that the, um, the disposition of land, the, the transfer, the annexation, all of this has been going on all of this time. And we've given up, you know, uh, not given up. In the UCC pen group, we had, you know, discussion about the language of the two-state solution. And we said, no, no more. Absolutely. And we don't want um, our church signing on to documents that support that. Um, and, and Peter said, you have to undo what has been written in good faith. At one time, we thought there could be a two-state solution, but that that day is long gone. Um, I know it's two, and you may have more questions. I, I would 
I like to share something that's a bit raw, but I think it fits. Please so I, um, I, um, I was there, you know, in 2014 and I watched and I wrote these action reports and there was one particular event that um, took me to the brink, to the edge. And you may relate to this even in your own life, but it was about uh, a mother who had been hit by um, a missile or mortar and she was pregnant and they took the baby out of her. Um, the baby lived named Shema. The mother died. Ah. Little Shema was in a little incubator. Yeah. And I, like everyone else was, oh, thank God. There is a God. You know, the baby lived. And then Israel um, blew up the power plant. So this is what I wrote. And the background is, I used to work in, um, as a chaplain in a hospital in the women's care unit. So I was often with um, families at end of life for children. I allowed myself. I can live on bread alone, fragments of hope, tea lights in a dark cave. Baby Shema, born from her dead mother, was my miracle baby. She was my sign that death doesn't win, that resurrection is still possible. So when she died and her state-of-the-art donated incubator because her oxygen was cut off, because they bombed the last power plant, I lost it. I let my faith go like a kite without a string. I let myself sink into a heap of blown up body parts of children, sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, uncles, aunts. I couldn't breathe. I allowed myself to sob, rock, and keen, to become her mother. I allowed myself to curse and finally to sing her a lullaby while I pulled out her tubes so I could hug her one more time. I allowed myself to touch the horror of it all. In addition to cultivating hope in the garden, I invite you in your own way, wherever you are, to allow yourself to feel the horror of what we are watching, what we are learning about each day. That's a source of strength also. And that is what binds us together. And as people of faith, whatever your faith tradition is, this cord between what we know about suffering and the suffering of the people has to be there for us to sustain the hope that they need. Lauren, I... I'm reluctant to say anything else. I, I want to just sit with what you've shared with us just for a minute. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I want I want you to have the last word still. Uh, but but uh, I uh, um, uh, thank you so much for uh, your comments today. Uh, I, I want to remind all of our uh, audience that. Today's program with Lauren will be uh, uh, on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel with all of our interviews. And we hope that you'll share the news of our interviews with your friends. Lauren, um, I feel like you've given us the, your parting words, but <laughs> uh, <trying> to. <laughs> uh, um, you, uh, um, do you want to say, uh, do you want to say, uh, uh, one final right. word or a word of prayer or a word of blessing or yeah. a, a charge to us uh, 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 as we as we go on our way uh, from, um, the, from the time to, together today? Um, I, I, I think I did a little bit. Um, yes, you did. Um, I, 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 I think I, all I can do is sort of say some version of what I just felt led to say, um, you don't have to have gone there, I think, to, to 
stand up and say something. Um, it does help because you can't unsee what you have seen. That's what we say. And the alternative tours that are available for people, um, you, you get it, you get it viscerally. But I think as human beings, we do get this. And that's where that branding, unbranding question for me comes from, is that we also, in the same vein, we understand um, what happened to the Jewish people and the Holocaust and people calling for their extermination. But in no uncertain terms, does it give this same group of people the right to erase the names as they sang the other night outside of Al-Aqsa? Yeah. We who can step back a little bit must not allow this for anyone. Uh, one of the pieces I wrote on Der Yassin when I was over there, I went on a tour because um, I'm the kind of person who needs to see and touch things to get it. And I called it Never Again for Anyone. And, and Peter said I couldn't use that title because it referred to the Holocaust. And it was meant for Jews speaking to Jews. And I said, well, uh, I actually belonged to a group called Never Again for Anyone uh, way before I um, became your missionary. And they are Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. And they are the most ardent, passionate, faithful people I've ever met. And they, they told me that this, is, this can't happen again for anyone. And, and, and then basically he said, you will be called you know, anti-Semitic if we use that title. You know, the church will be, and you represent the church. So I had this quandary, as I often do. And if you know me, I'm in this quandary often. So, you know, besides being an artist, I guess I'm just a forever troublemaker. So I call my Jewish friend Offer, who I used to go to for counsel on things. I tell him what's happened. And he goes, you need a good quote from a good Jew, don't you? I said, I do offer. <laughs> Can you say something? And then within minutes on my little cell phone, I get a little paragraph in which he says basically the same thing. And I quote him and the article gets published. So we have double duty to do besides standing up for Palestinian rights. We have to stand up for human rights and we must also hear the deep ongoing trauma that has happened to our Jewish sisters and brothers. And, and, um, and so I seek out, and I have copied now a bunch of links to statements from Rabbis for Human Rights, from Arthur Waskoff, from the Shalom Center, from ICAD, from Israelis and Jews here in the United States and there about the current situation. Yeah. And I learned from how they talk about it. So I guess I, I'm adding a coda to what I said earlier we must also um, seek allies with everyone who can name this Kairos moment um, and who are our allies. Lauren, thank you for joining us today.